code. Okay, now I need to figure out how to get it to only. Do I need to share my computer sound? Can I, do I have to share, is this a video? So that's gonna take video. Yeah. So can I just have, can I like not share my video on my computer? You mean this right here? Yeah. I think probably. Um, I just hide the thumbnail. Yeah, but what you want to do is. I have the picture of the instructions that he had me take, but. We're like stuck on the last two steps. We have to do like. Or like, I'm curious, like, is it like gonna share? Well, the, the PowerPoint gets uploaded, doesn't it? And then it shares the, the talk. Does it, does it, like, will it share this? Oh, I bet that's what it's, do oh, look at that. What? That's it. That's what's sharing. This is where, it, okay. Oh, shit. Okay, how do I? Oh, okay, right there. Right there. And then back. Okay, there we go. Oh, she's too wide. And just right. Is that the share screen thing? That must be the share screen. Because why else would it be green? Yeah. Just watch that. I'll be wrong. I honestly have no idea. They'll be like, wow, this person has tons of presenter notes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how she, you know, I can. I print off a whole sheet, so. I have that too, as a backup. Because, you know, I, yeah, I'm nervous right now. So I think, yeah, I like always have to use note cards or have notes, because like, otherwise I will forget what I want to say. We, we were, we record, record. Cloud. I think we did that, right? I, yeah, we did the record the cloud. Okay. It was just your, yeah. how do you check it? I hope so. Yeah, I don't. Oh, yeah, it's a good idea. Very good idea. Thanks for ordering them. No, it's cool. So I clocked this at like somewhere between 40 and 45 minutes. Yeah. And I practiced it. Okay. Because I practiced it like three times today. And every time it's between 40 and 45 minutes. Should this like point that way? Like in your general direction and also the general direction. But yes, yeah, yeah, it's normally. If you log on, can you see through these two? I think he's logging on right yeah. now. Great. Oh, look at that. Oh, I figured out. Okay, you can see it. It needs to go up. It's 
still needs to go up. <laughs> oh, Is there a way you can? Look at this very tactfully <laughs> placed chalk. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, if you're in a way to help this up. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I would be afraid to do that. Is there a way to get the camera to move up? Normally it like registers. Look at those. Is it working? Oh, good. Perfect. Uh, yeah, here you do. Okay, so you better get it done. Stop making too much noise. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> Okay, so this is the point of feedback. That's nice to have some confidence that it works. Yeah, I know. Tracy said that you guys like Peggy, so. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank Those you. Really good. Yeah. And I definitely don't want to bring it up. Yeah, we need to go back. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to you after. Yeah. We'll them for next, next session. Okay, I, I think uh, we should get started because there may be some people online that would like to be able to watch the seminar. Uh, other people come in, they will come, of course. So today uh, we have uh, Winnie, uh, Winnie, I don't even know your first name. Sarah. I mean, I always call but, you Winnie. But everyone, everyone is my name, Sarah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I've had conversations over the past year or so, so I have a sense of what uh, Winnie was working on, but she had a project where she was looking at the uh, very pothole uh, wetland, looking at connections between the hydrology and the uh, chemistry of them. And so she's going to be presenting uh, results that she has from that. This is the basis for her uh, PhD uh, dissertation. Seeing what you come up with. Okay, Winnie. Go I look ahead. forward to seeing it too. <laughs> uh, thanks. It, it's uh, really nice to be able to share this research with some folks. Um, so yeah. So like uh, like we've already established, I'm, I'm looking at prairie pothole wetlands. Um, these are like little depressional basins um, that are um, in intensively uh, cultivated landscapes. And we're looking at two different restoration strategies and basically how those two strategies influence ecosystem structure and function in these basins. Now, um, you might think that, that this story starts in these little wetlands, but it actually doesn't, doesn't start there. It actually starts um, in the larger lakes and rivers that end up receiving the, the nutrients that are being, are basically bypassing these little basins, these little wetland basins. So this is an image of, of Lake Erie. Um, and we as humans have this, we have this nutrient problem. We have, we have a problem. Um, and basically since the Green Revolution, um, nutrient use has really blossomed. Um, and, uh, and that's both for, for nitrogen and phosphorus. And, we have this growing population, which means more, more agriculture, more conversion of the landscape to row crop agriculture, and, um, and also climate change is, is another part of this, right? So we have more unpredictable weather patterns that are, are leading to, um, you know, 
large pulses of, of water moving through the system and thus you know, basically draining all of these nutrients off of the landscape. Um, so this nutrient loss across the landscape is, is what's causing eutrophication, widespread eutrophication, and algal blooms like this in Lake Erie, and, and closer to home in smaller bodies of water. Um, and this agricultural intensification is, is a key part of the puzzle. Um, and it's a key part because you end up having more pollution. So this is an image of one of my wetlands, and it's surrounded by an alfalfa field. Um, and, and there's a growing body of evidence that as we have uh, increased land cover that's, that's put into row crop agriculture, we also have increased nitri nitrate runoff. But it's not just nitrate, it's also phosphorus. Um, and we also know that, that if you have more wetlands on the landscape, um, where like, so in, these, in this case, uh, lighter color means fewer wetlands and darker color means more wetlands, um, regardless of whether you have really high agricultural um, area on the landscape, you do have lower nitrate runoff and no, lower pollution. So we know that we need wetlands in order to meet our water quality goals. Um, and, and luckily, you know, we have an opportunity to restore a lot of those basins that were once green. So this is an image, an aerial image from Grant County, Minnesota in the heart of my study area. And in a one square mile section, um, there are 12 basins that have been drained. So 12 wetlands per square mile, at least in this, in this one mile. And um, this is indicative of the past drainage, the extent of the past drainage, but it's also indicative of, of our opportunity to restore basins, right? We have a huge opportunity and we need to know how to do it in a way where we can optimize ecosystem services provided by these wetlands. Um, having said that, we have an extra hurdle. That extra hurdle is that small basins like these that are surrounded by agriculture tend to have, um, tend to accumulate eroded soil from the surrounding landscape. So, in the past, we had a landscape that was dominated by prairie, at least throughout the prairie popple region. Um, and when we came in and we converted all of this land to agriculture, we lost all of these deep rooted plants that essentially held the soil in place. So now when we have um, rainfall events, we get erosion of the surrounding landscape into these little wetland basins. Now, you might say, well, it can't possibly be that bad. Well, to that, I say there are some examples that really are that bad. Um, so in the bottom here, you can see that there is a, a um, pit that was dug into the ground. This is from a site that's being restored as we speak. Uh, and the image was taken two days ago. This is a kind of an up close image of that same pit, that same hole. And you can see that there's this, this lighter colored soil over darker layers of soil. Um, and that, this is accumulated sediment from the surrounding landscape, okay? Now, last night, because I'm a nerd, love being a nerd, just laying in bed and I was like, you know, I can't sleep. I'm gonna look at those pictures again. They're pretty cool. And I realized that this is actually a little bit more complicated than I previously thought. There's actually two layers of sediment in here. Um, and it's kind of hard to see on, on this screen right here, but on your computer screen, you'll be able to see a little better. But basically, we have this right here is um, B soil horizon. So this is underneath the, the topsoil. This was the old topsoil from the surrounding landscape. And way down here, there is this darker layer of soil that actually used to be the wetland soils in this basin. Okay. In this case, we're looking at about two feet, two feet. And then, you know, so that's like what, four feet of sediment just sitting around that, that has eroded into this basin. In some cases, we'll see basins with up to six feet of sediment. So we need to know when we restore these basins, should we be excavating out this sediment? And the reason why we need to know is because it, it costs a lot of money to do that. Moving dirt is expensive. Okay, so when we go to restore a wetland, we have a couple of options for how to do that. There's what I'm calling a business as usual option, um, or we could also call it a control, but I'm gonna call it business as usual. 
Uh, basically, what you do here is you reverse engineer everything you did to, to drain the wetland. So you plug drainage ditches and break tile drains. And this then re-wets the basin. It's the most economical option because it involves the least effort. In an excavation scenario, you would go in with a bulldozer and you'd scrape out all of the accumulated sediment, push it up onto the surrounding hill slope, and then you would break tile drains and plug drainage ditches. Uh, in this case, you're re-wetting the basin still, uh, but you're also restoring the topography of the basin. Having said that, it's super expensive because bulldozers and the people that operate them are not cheap. Okay, in addition to restoring topography, there are other un potentially unintended impacts that we should be considering um, when we are moving sediment around and or leaving it in place. In particular, there's an effect on hydro period. So um, shallower basins that tend to be higher in the watershed are typically seasonal in hydro period. So they'll, they'll dry out once or twice a year. Semi-permanent basins are usually located lower in the watershed and they're usually deeper. Um, and they dry out once every 10 to 20 years. Um, so usually, whether you're a seasonal or a semi-permanent wetland depends on uh, your position in the landscape. However, uh, we've had a lot more drainage on the landscape, right, tile drainage, um, and sediment could also be influencing this, right? So you could have a basin that's really low in the watershed, uh, really close to a stream, a river, but it's just filled in with so much sediment that it would tend to be seasonal in nature if you weren't excavating. Okay, then we can also consider the sediment itself. So sediment has tons of nitrogen and phosphorus just waiting to be released. And that is especially true in an agricultural setting because there has been years of, of basically deposition of nutrients from fertilizers. So if we were to relocate the sediment up onto the surrounding landscape, we would give those nutrients some time to be assimilated by plants and then mineralized, and then assimilated and mineralized, and work their way back down into the basin, more similar to what we might expect to, uh, uh, might expect to see in a natural system. So that's potentially an effect that we might see from, from excavating these basins. But the million dollar question is still, like we can hypothesize all we want, but <laughs> does excavation actually optimize ecosystem services in wetland restoration, or are we just, sort of waving our hands like I'm doing right now. <laughs> okay, so to get at this, we, we had a couple of sort of big questions. Um, ecosystem service-wise, one of the things that these wetlands do is they, they're storing nutrients. So do excavated wetlands store more nutrient than business as usual wetlands? Um, and does that change over time? In order to address that, there are a couple places you can look. The first place is looking at the vegetation. So plants like to assimilate nutrients and we kind of want to know how much nutrient is going into plant matter and then you know, being temporarily stored. In addition, the soil is a huge nutrient pool, right? We already established that. Um, but do we see trends and, and changes over time in response to, um, to excavation? We also want to know what's going in, on in terms of water quality, right? Um, the reason why this is important is, might seem very obvious, or maybe not, I don't know. Um, but it's because that's the water that's eventually going to be making its way into groundwater and into, into down gradient surface water. So we want to make sure that that water that's reaching these weather, that's in these wetlands is fairly clean, at least by the time it's had a chance to react a little bit. So we can do that by looking at water quality trends through time, um, and we can look at one of the major ecosystem services of wetlands, which is nitrogen removal. In order to do all that, we started by looking at 55 wetlands. Um, these were split among business as usual and excavated basins, and, um, and they were mostly seasonal basins, but there were some semi-permanent basins as well. Um, all of these wetlands were located in west central Minnesota, and they ranged in age from 0.15 to 5.7 acres. 
So these are what you would call maybe pocket sized buttons, right? You could like put it in your pocket, just walk away with it. I don't know. <laughs> I actually just read that yesterday. I thought it was really funny. And so I was like, I'm totally using that. <laughs> um, and then they also ranged in age from, from zero to nine years. Um, and so what we did was we used a space for time substitution when we were looking at temporal effects on, on, of restoration. So before I go too much further, I just want to take, take a breath to acknowledge that none of this research was going to happen without the Fish and Wildlife Service. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, provided me access to sites and that they had previously restored. Um, they also provided me access to the Prairie Wetland Learning Center where I am housed during the field season. But also there's a great outreach opportunity or out, outreach resources at the Prairie Wetland Learning Center. So I have been able to participate in a lot of events sharing the results of my research, but also getting kids and adults excited about wetlands. And, um, Partners for Fish and Wildlife and private landowners. Basically, these are people who are just passionate about nature and they help out with either donating land or providing access to land. Um, and I've had a, a lot of good experiences working with landowners and, and getting access to the property. So, um, yeah, so I just want to acknowledge that. And if you know anyone, just a little plug. If you know anyone, or if you're someone who has um, sort of land that was in your family and, and looking at having to maybe sell it, but you don't really want to do that, one of the nice things about working with Fish and Wildlife Service is that they can help you find an option that works for you to be able to, um, to restore your land um, into a natural, a more natural state. And it, and it helps wildlife and it helps water quality. So that's my little plug. Okay, and they don't get paid for that either. So that was like free advertising. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about some vegetation. It's a really cool picture, right? That was like my favorite picture ever. Maybe not ever, but it was pretty up, pretty up there. Anyway, so <laughs> what we did is we looked at, we surveyed 24 of our 55 wetlands and we, um, we did pretty intense vegetation surveys where we were trying to figure out um, which species are there, are in these wetlands, and what is their approximate cover um, in, in the basin. Then we came out and we went to all of our wetlands again, and we took, quad, we took quadrats and we made, uh, we measured the cover of individual species, of each individual species in a quadrat, and then we um, harvested all the biomass and developed a uh, cover biomass relationship. So we were able to um, estimate basically based on how, what is the percent cover of a plant in a wetland, what its biomass then was. We also thought, well, as long as we're out here, we might as well get some nutrients out of the deal. <laughs> and so um, this graph is just showing you um, species specific nutrient content per unit biomass. And I don't expect you to know what any of these species are. The point of this is just to, to demonstrate that there's a huge variability in the nutrient content of uh, within um, individual species. So, okay, so um, I'm assuming that everyone here uh, hang, hangs out, likes water, right? Yeah, generally speaking. Okay, if there's not, I'll take it. Um, so, and you've all seen a wetland before. Yeah, okay, cool. So what species do you think is responsible for holding the most nutrient in any given wetland, just like on average? Grasses. Grasses, okay, that's a good guess. What else we got? Got any other? Uh, cattail. Cattail, okay. Any others? Sedges. Sedges, okay, very good. All right, I got three. I was looking for three, so. <laughs> All right. So the answer is actually a combination of cattails and grasses. Um, so cattails are located right here, right? This is, this is bio, or nutrient phosphorus per unit area contained by individual species. So you may notice that cattail has quite a bit of phosphorus stored in its biomass. When we look at nitrogen, this tends to lean more towards uh, root canary grass, which is the next one down on our phosphorus graph here. 
So these two are invasive species. Almost all the rest of these are native species. There are a couple of invasives in here, but they're in new comers to Minnesota, and so they haven't had quite a chance to establish yet. So these are the two most aggressive invasive species in our basin. But it turns out that even though they hold the most nutrient, native species, which store less nutrient, um, are more likely to attract wildlife that will come in and eat some seeds or harvest some of the biomass that they can basically eat it, and then move that nutrient someplace else, right? So they're more, they're serving a better, a more, uh, more of the ecosystem functional roles that we were anticipating from wetlands in general, or that we want from wetlands in general. general. But we also see that there's this emerging sort of invasive native story. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that because it'll inform how these plants are storing nutrients it's as a, a community. It's a frag. Phragmites Pragmite, is one of the emerging invasives. What is your story on frag? No. Okay. <laughs> it's a good guess though. Okay, so we did these surveys, right, of all the vegetation. And what we found was that um, excavated sites shown in here, shown here in gold, um, had higher diversity, Shannon diversity scores than uh, business as usual sites shown here in gray. Um, on the x-axis, we're looking at wetland age. And, and you'll notice that there's also a decline in diversity over time. Um, so what we did is we looked at, okay, well, we kind of thought this cattail and reef canary grass seem to be the, the main guys doing all the invading here. So we're wondering if maybe they're affecting diversity. So we took the cattail and canary grass cover, divided it by the overall cover of all vegetation. And what we see is that over time, we start with low aggressive invasive species cover, and it increases pretty dramatically, pretty quickly. Sort of corresponds really well with those declines in those diversity numbers. And by year six, any benefits that we had had from excavation were gone, right? So that knocking back of those invasive species, that was all gone by the time we hit year six. And there are a couple of theories that people have about why um, excavation is influencing plant communities. One of those ideas is that um, the sediment uh, covers up the native species seeping, and then, and so by removing it, you're exposing native species seed. Now, if that were the case, we would expect to see much higher uh, species richness of native species in excavated sites compared to business as usual sites. So here um, we have business as usual sites on the left, activated sites on the right. Um, native species are shown in gold and invasive species are shown, shown in um, blue. And then we're looking at species richness. And what you can see is that there isn't a difference in, in, in uh, native species richness at excavated sites versus business as usual sites. Um, and that's important because it suggests that the alternate theory or the alternate um, hypothesis about what's going on in terms of native and invasive species with regard to excavation is probably accurate. And that alternate theory is that um, agriculture tends to select for disturbance hardy species, okay? And moreover, uh, sediment tends to accumulate weedy species seeds species seeds, okay? So if you have a bunch of this sediment going into a basin and it's just chock full of invasive species seed, when you scrape it out, you're actually just moving that seed someplace where it's not gonna be a problem anymore, right? Especially if we're looking at species that like to have a wet foot, okay? So we're actually just removing a bunch of invasive species seed, which initially knocks back their, their cover and their biomass. Having said that, these invasive species are able to recover very quickly following restoration, okay? So um, that their cover bounces back, but also their biomass, and of course, the nutrients that they're storing. So when you look at nitrogen um, accumulation over time and phosphorus accumulation over time, it's really being driven by, um, by invasive species. Um, However, you know, there is a significant decrease in invasive species or in the overall nutrient being stored because we see a decrease in invasive species uh, biomass. 
this suggests that there's sort of this management trade-off, right? So excavation is going to improve the diversity of your of your wetland, which is usually why people like people are restoring these basins, not just because they want to like improve water quality, but because they're kind of interested in like the wildlife that goes with it, right? So if they want to see birds, they don't want to see like a cesspool in the backyard, you know? So you could either get, excavate and get better diversity or, but that's gonna like, your trade-off is that you're not gonna assimilate as many nutrients in the biomass. And it only improves diversity for like five years or six years. Right, right, that's the other part. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I have, I've had, I've had a few conversations with people about how one might address that issue in a way that both creates monetary value and would take care of some of these invasive species over time. Um, right, okay, so then the other thing I wanted to point out is that um, they, these plants are actually holding twice that of nutrient. Uh, per meter squared, so 45 grams of nitrogen per meter squared and 6.6 .6 grams of phosphorus per meter squared. And that's a reliable and predictable um, storage of nutrients. Having said that, um, this is also a temporary form, right? So these plants assimilate the nutrients and then when they go dormant, they're gonna, they're gonna let some of that nutrient go, but then they're also gonna flop over and then leach out some of that nutrient. However, the hope is that some of that nutrient will also get buried in the sediments brings us to our next point, soils, okay? So what we did is we took three soil cores from within each basin. Uh, we had them evenly spaced out. We, uh, we took 30 centimeter cores, divided it into six sections. And then we took the top, middle, and bottom of, the, of that soil profile. And we did a bunch of math, which to some may be a black box, but to us, it's multiplying by bulk density and by the portion of the soil profile that, this that, these, um, that these individual sections of core represent. And then we um, added up all of those soil numbers. And what we got from that, through the black box of math, was nutrient storage in milligrams per meter squared. So you might ask then, or we might want to address this sort of question of, of uh, what we might be expecting in terms of soil, um, uh, soil nutrient trends. And the reason why I want to address this is because soils are operating on a very different time scale than people are. So they're operating on a geologic time scale. Usually, you know, like a thousand years would be like what we would expect to see changes in. Whereas we're operating on maybe like, you know, like a 60 year time scale. <laughs> okay, so in a, representation of a wetland, um, we might expect to see sort of primary production that could be as emergent macrophytes or as plankton. And I wish I could have fit like little eyes in there, but you know what? It was really small on my screen. <laughs> so, okay, so these, when this primary production sort of dies and, and sinks to the bottom, over time you get accumulation of this deposited material and you would expect to see in that deposited material lower density, higher, bio, higher mass of, of nitrogen and phosphorus. And you'd expect to see um, that at your, sort of your initial time point, if you excavated, that you'd have sort of lower nutrients to begin with, but then you'd have this deposition of much, much higher nutrient material on top. Okay, so over time, you're expecting higher nutrients. That's the plan. Should we see if the plan happens? I mean, I'm gonna see. So here we're looking at, uh, again, business as usual is in gold, excavated site, or sorry, excavated sites are in gold. Business as usual is in gray, age on the x-axis. We're looking at nitrogen, fo total phosphorus, and bioavailable phosphorus, or brails and phosphorus. The red dashed line is, um, is a response that we got, or the, the nutrient storage in a set of reference wetlands um, that surrounded our, our um, sites, or that were like interspersed around our sites. So the first thing that we saw was sort of what we expected is that excavation was gonna remove some portion of the nutrient from the actual basin. Um, 
And that was true for both nitrogen and phosphorus. And then we also saw that there was a, an increase in the nitrogen over time, uh, particularly at the excavated sites. But we also saw that like this data is really super duper messy, right? Like you kind of have to squint to see it. Like it just feels like what the heck? Well, okay, remember how like it these soils operate on this geologic time scale? It's pretty cool that we even saw a response. And over time we saw a response with regard to nitrogen. So like I'm actually counting that as a, as a win, right? Because it takes time for these trends to develop. And we wouldn't necessarily expect to see that in the first eight years. Uh, with regard to the Bray Olson phosphorus, we didn't see any effects of, of excavation, but we did see um, an effect of the hydro period. So uh, seasonal basins shown in green and had much higher, um, much higher Bray Olson phosphorus than the uh, semi-permanent basins and reference basins, and actually reference and semi-permanent basins had very similar um, bioavailable phosphorus uh, numbers. Okay, I put these numbers down here to show you like just like, we're talking about like screaming high nutrient storage in the soils, okay? But really importantly, 7.2 grams of bioavailable phosphorus per meter squared on average in these basins. You may recall that plants accounted for approximately 6.6 .6 grams per meter squared of phosphorus. So this suggests that um, in general, plants are probably taking up about what's available per year to them, right? They're like, oh, sweet, I got some phosphorus. I'm going to take that up. Um, so they're accounting for a fairly large pool of phosphorus in these systems. OK, so with regard to our question, um, with regard to our question, vegetation is a super important bait pool um, of, of uh, nutrients in our, in our wetlands. In particular, they're really important with regard to phosphorus. Um, and this means that like we could actually consider using uh, sort of like a, a harvesting approach to try and control phosphorus availability on the landscape. Um, by trying to just take off some of these invasive species, which might help us control invasive species over time. And you could compost that biomass to turn it into something you can sell. That's what I was alluding to earlier. <laughs> um, and there are actually people who are working on that. Um, excavation also tended to decrease nutrient assimilation, but it reduced invasive species cover. So it's sort of a trade-off, right? Which one are you going to take? Um, we also saw that soils were just a huge pool of stored nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, having said that, in the eight years immediately following restoration, we can't really expect to see um, recovery to a pre-drainage state. Um, so it takes a while to recover these, the, the soil nutrient pools. Also, um, excavation did decrease soil total nutrient content um, in the basin, and, and that, was, that was cool because in, in excavated sites, we also had this slow accumulation of that nitrogen over time, which would be more similar to what we would expect. Okay, and remember, that's just a place where we're, like, we're storing those nutrients so that it's not making its way into the water. Um, which is what we're gonna look at next, which is what's going on in the water. This is the water that's eventually gonna make its way down into our groundwater or to the lakes and streams that we care about because we're either drinking from them or we're eating things from them or we're going swimming in them. Okay, and then we're gonna look at that again through looking at just water quality through time. Okay, so here, um, we have seasonal basins on the left-hand panel, panel and semi-permanent basins on the right-hand panel. Um, the y-axis is um, looking at total dissolved nutrients, so nitrogen and phosphorus. And what we can see is that um, excavation definitely reduced the nitrogen and phosphorus availability following restoration. Um, 
and it increased those those nutrient concentrations did tend to increase over time but that's again something that we might expect in just a naturally occurring wetland because they're holding on to nutrients they're keeping them in the basin um, this is also something we might expect from the standpoint of how we may have altered nutrient cycling in the watershed so remember this is like from like 12 slides ago so i don't expect you to remember it but you know the picture's pretty so um we pushed our sediment back up onto the surrounding landscape in these excavated basins right and the thought was was that it would take a little bit of time for those nutrients to make their way back into the basin in general what we're seeing in terms of water quality is that indeed the nutrients are are We've initially lowered our nutrient concentration and the nutrients are slowly working their way back in into the system. We also saw that seasonally flooded basins tend to have higher dissolved nutrient content. Um, this could be because uh, seasonal basins are, are sort of like the first line of defense against, against nutrient pollution, right? They're, they're usually higher in the watersheds. So they're usually receiving more of these nutrients and processing them before the nutrients make their way down into other bodies of water through um, near surface or like near surface groundwater flow. It's just a hypothesis, throwing it out there. <laughs> um, okay, but the, new, the form of the nutrients that we are looking at actually matters, right? So total dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus is one thing, but whether it's organic or inorganic really matters. And the reason why is because inorganic nutrients tend to be much more reactive than organic nutrients, which are less accessible, more recalcitrant. Um, and it's just like, you know, it's better to eat broccoli than to eat a Snickers, right? So same deal here. So in these graphs, I'm still looking at, we're still plotting total dissolved nutrients on, on the y-axis. But um, this time, we are looking at inorganic nutrients in this top portion in the lighter colors. And that, and that portion of the, of the total dissolved nutrient pool is plotted on top of the organic fraction, okay? So if you sum up the organic and the inorganic, you have the total dissolved nutrient. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. So darker is organic. I was thinking humic acid, clearly darker. You, did, okay, that was that was kind of funny. So like, I think it's too warm in here. <laughs> okay, so what did we find? We found that um, with regard to nitrogen, there was very little inorganic nitrogen available, like almost nothing. And of that almost nothing, over eighty five percent was as ammonia. Okay, so like nitrate, the problem child in the nutrient world, it wasn't there. Or we call it the, I mean, I call it the problem child of the nutrient world because it causes, you know, human health problems and it kills cattle, right? Okay, cool. So, um, with regard to phosphorus, we found that seasonal basins tended to have really high inorganic nutrient pools and really low organic nutrient pools. Now, this jives pretty well with our, um, our bioavailable phosphorus in soils. Um, remember, we have like super high seasonal basin bioavailable phosphorus. Well, it could be because there's um, flipping redox conditions in these basins, and also um, seasonal basins tend to have really high, actually, all these basins have really high um, carbonate content um, because they're receiving water that's weathering the, the substrate. And so we can have a lot of this phosphorus basically precipitating with calcium or when it gets oxygenated, fixing itself to, temporary fixing itself to, um, to iron particles in the soils. So it makes sense that to some extent with these flipping redox conditions, we hypothesize that we might have some of this um, higher phosphorus content. On the other hand, semi-permanent wetlands had super low inorganic phosphorus and most of their phosphorus was actually in the organic form. Also, just in general, semi-permanent basins didn't have as much nutrient. So um, that's something to consider, I guess. Uh, okay, then if we, I wanna like take just a, just take a beat to talk about the inorganic nitrogen one more time. 
So this is indicative, these really low inorganic nitrogen content is indicative of one of the functions, one of the primary functions of wetlands, of these depressional wetlands, which is um, nitrogen removal or, or denitrification. So we wanted to measure denitrification. And the way we did that was we, we looked at two different things. We wanted to know like, what's going on in terms of season. So throughout the growing season, are we seeing any changes in denitrification? And in terms of the business as usual excavated question, are we seeing any differences? And we also wanted to see how it's being affected by age. So it turns out, I already changed the slide. So you can see that there is no effect of excavation on denitrification rates. It's like nothing. There's no effect. Okay. But seasonal, like, so the hydro period did affect um, denitrification rates. So seasonal basins tended to have higher denitrification rates, which is kind of cool because again, this would sort of corroborate this notion that we have these flippy redox conditions. Some studies have shown that, um, there have been a few studies that have shown that when you have uh, basin or when you have areas where there's um, multiple redox conditions in close proximity, that you have this coupled nitrification denitrification, which very well could be what's happening when you have flipping from um, sort of a drawdown period to a in it re inundation. Um, so the, the systems are more primed and ready to go. Having said that, semi permanent basins have a longer re water residence time. So, again, trade offs. In addition, we found that over time, um, as wetlands got older, they tended to have higher rates of denitrification, but you'll see, you can see that it's sort of messy in there. Um, but the take home message is that over time, we do actually see an increase in, in denitrification rates. Um, in terms of the what month we're in, growing season, background temperature, there isn't much of an effect at all. Okay, we're so close to having this unified idea of what excavation does. So let's put it all together. Okay, so in verse. In answer to our question about water quality and how excavation might be affecting that, we found that excavation definitely improved water quality. Um, and that's an awesome thing because it protects down gradient systems. We also found that semi-permanent basins had better water quality. Um, and that could be a function of the water residence time being higher. Um, Wetland restoration um, in general, however, definitely decreased inorganic nitrogen content. So if there's a question about like, do I restore or not? And you can't decide between excavation or business as usual, just, just restore the wetland and don't worry about the rest of it because it's gonna help with this nutrient problem that we have on a local basis. Um, <laughs> and then finally, denitrification was definitely highest at seasonal basins. Um, so if you don't have a lot of land, that you can restore, um, it's okay because even like these smaller basins are have a really high rate of denitrification. So, you know, every little bit helps. And clearly, the seasonal basins are doing a lot. You're getting a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak. Okay. So let's put this in the context of our overarching question about excavation and whether or not it's optimizing ecosystem services when we in wetland restoration. So when it comes to water quality, um, definitely, definitely excavate because excavated basins had way better nutrient or way better water quality than um, the business as usual basins. And I think a lot of that has to do with just moving the nutrients into a new location and giving them more of a more of a chance to actually go through, uh, be assimilated, and then and then move slowly into the basin in a way that you know basin can handle it. It's like a sugar rush, right? It's a lot harder on your body when you just like down a gallon of Kool Aid than when you like you know you have the Kool Aid over like you know a month. Did that jive with anyone? Because loving the Kool Aid over here. No, okay, all right. You might also want to consider a uh, hydro period. This is really important because um, semi-permanent wetlands had way lower soil nutrient content 
than seasonal basins. Um, and that's probably, I mean, has to do to some extent, probably completely, to the higher water residence time. Uh, seasonal wetlands also, though, had high, high denitrification rates, denitrification rates. So it's not like we're losing, we're getting, it's not like we're getting terrible ecosystem function or completely not having ecosystem function and services from these seasonal basins. It's just, you know, it's different, right? You're getting different things from different types of hybrid periods. So consider what you need in the basin, in the watershed in general. Okay, there's also management trade-offs, and that's particularly true with regard to vegetation. So excavation definitely improves biodiversity initially, um, but it decreased the nutrient storage. Um, having said that, that nutrient storage recovered really quickly, and your biodiversity declined really quickly. So maybe we have an opportunity, opportunity to consider harvesting as a management tool that could make us some money and help control invasive species, as well as relocating nutrients from the wetland basin elsewhere under the landscape, where again, we're gonna have longer residence time, um, be able to like basically meter the flow of these nutrients. And finally, it takes time to recover um, the reference to reference conditions, right? So we saw this especially with the soils, but like we can't expect any of these restored basins to just give us all of their ecosystem services overnight. It's not like set it and forget it. It's like set it and I got to visit it a few times to make sure that we're doing okay. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I want to thank the funding sources, my collaborators and partners of uh, the university here. Um, my advisor, it's been awesome. And, uh, and basically, yeah, everyone who I've worked with uh, has been really amazing. So uh, with that, uh, I'll take any questions. And if you want, I can have a different, you know, get birds. Oh, everyone does that, I love it. Okay, I'll save with birds. <laughs> So I had no idea that there were wetlands in the prairie. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, there wetlands everywhere here. in the prairie. Okay. Oh, okay. Where are you from originally? Maryland. Oh, okay. We've got wetlands, but no, like. But no prairie. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super wetland dense area. Um, the prairie pothole region, um, we only, currently we only have 20% um, of the wetlands that we used to have. So 80% of the wetlands have been drained throughout the prairie pothole region. And, um, it used to be known for its amazing productivity of, of waterfowl. So it's great breeding habitat. Um, and that's slowly diminishing as we move in lower levels. We're, how was working with any of the private landowners that you worked with? Uh, so the ones who were working with the Fish and Wildlife Service already, it was great. Um, for the ones who I contacted to try and have access to reference basins, um, it worked out a lot better when those reference basins were owned by the city. <laughs> but I called about a hundred people, private landowners, where I had identified a, a wetland on their property that could have been over a hundred years old. And um, I heard back for four, and of those, I am using two. Because when I heard back, two of them were like, we have to think about it. And then they called me back and they said, we don't trust that you're not going to like make us look bad. And I was like, I don't. <laughs> it's just a trust thing. You have to build trust. It's a relationship building thing. It takes time. So when you're talking about nutrient storage, um, the native um, plant species, I was wondering if you had any kind of reference to an established wetland with more established native plant populations that had been disturbed and if that was any different from um, the nutrient storage that you saw in these more established wetlands. So I'm actually um, I'm actually working on um, I did do surveys um, at some of our reference basins mm -hmm. and um, 
I'm working right now on trying to apply our nutrient, uh, our, our biomass cover relationships and then our nutrient numbers to that. So I will, within the next couple of weeks, actually have numbers for that. I'm just curious if the, the invasive species are that much more competitive for nutrients or if it's actually better than fancy. There's no, no pick up on it. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. So um, part of it, a huge part of it, to be honest, is, is has to do with the phenology of the, of the plants. Okay. So uh, reed canary grass and hybrid cattail both start to, they, they start to, sh they shoot earlier in the year and then they stay green later in the fall. So they have a huge phen phenology advantage. They're, they're photosynthesizing and other plants are just like, oh, I'm done. Like we're done for the year. In addition to that, Reed canary grass, recent research has shown that it's not actually, in Minnesota, it's not genetically different than, it, than the native variety. Okay, so we've always had reed canary grass. There was a long time we thought that there was an invasive variety in Minnesota, but there isn't. The majority of quote unquote invasive Reed canary, reed canary grass is actually invasive because we've added so much nutrients to the landscape that they have gone from being sort of an even player to being the main guy. So that's part of what's going on too. Anywhere that's had nutrient application at any point is probably going to see some degree of invasive species encroachment. Yeah, so just to follow up. That and you know, your lower initial higher invasives, and you just thought you don't have as much invasive advantage and lower nutrients. You know, almost a bigger cycle. I think you're maybe pointing towards the invasives. Oh, with added nutrient as the nutrients are increasing? Right, as the nutrients increase. So, yeah. and there's always, I mean, it could be some type of issue, but it may also be you know, Yeah. So um, the, the one thing that I would say that, that, that might contradict that is that most of the nutrients in the basins, um, with the exception of inorganic phosphorus, are in the organic, or, or with the exception of seasonal basins and, and phosphorus. Most of it's in the organic form, which is not terribly easy for invasive, invasive species really love that that inorganic form, right? So if it's in the organic form, it's gonna be easier for basically native species to try and establish. So I'd say that it probably helps just having it be delivered in a different form over time. But you're right, you're definitely still fertilizing the system. That's also what these systems do over time. They definitely accumulate that nutrient. All of them. Okay. So even with that buffer, and then so the second um, from the nutrient, especially nitrogen removal for the semi-permanent permit or seasonal wetlands, wouldn't the excavation of uh, maybe increase the summer permanence of it because the reconnected is no longer more efficiently than the same. Yeah, so we have some hydrology data, some water level data that we're trying to, this has been like a work in progress over a long period of time because I have so many things going on. <laughs> but we're working on trying to put together an idea of how connected are these basins to the groundwater supply. And um, we, so we censored um, 11 sites and uh, five of them were excavated and six of them were business as usual. And we're trying to understand if that excavation actually increased the connectivity to the groundwater supply. So it's definitely possible that that could be part of what's going on with regard to having redox redox conditions with regard to having um, different nutrient concentrations in the water column as well. Okay. 
right? So back towards the beginning of the presentation, you talked about all the sentiment that government was present in these uh, awful uh, wetlands. And you gave, showed two layers. The first, I, I wanted to make sure I understood, the first layer is on the imposed problem erosion. Mm -hmm. I thought you were saying that the first layer was from more recent erosion, the second layer was from under natural conditions. Is that what uh, So it's actually, um, it's actually more indicative of uh, the extent of the erosion. So, um, well, I'm not going to go back to it. But um, so, uh, as so, the the top layer, the A horizon in in the soil profile, is this like it accumulates a lot of this organic um, organic matter because roots are dying, and basically you get more organics, more nitrogen, phosphorus. Below that, you have the B horizon, which has some leaching of those nutrients down. And then below that, you have the C horizon, right? So that first layer, so the, the bottom layer, not the first layer, not the top layer, the, the, the bottom layer was um, the A horizon, right? The old, it, a, old, old A horizon. Old A horizon, right? So it ran off and then deposited down there. And now, and then above that was the B horizon. So we had like basically an, in, an inverse soil profile from what we would expect, okay? So on top of that, we had the B horizon, which is lighter in color because it has fewer of those organic, accumulated organic matter. So, I mean, the, the interesting part about it is that, you know, that, that soil profile, you would expect to see that in the uplands except upside down. <laughs> so whenever you go into a place and you're like, you dig down and you're like, holy, oh, this doesn't look normal. It's probably because it used to be a wetland. You gotta turn around and stand in the middle. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so then also about the control of the invasives, uh, is there a way to do harvesting so that you can control it more? You know, the timing, because you were saying that it's analog technology. Technology, yeah. Yes, <laughs> analogy is <laughs> analog. <laughs> <laughs> different. Such that you've got, you know, in this case, the invasives that are coming up quicker. And I don't know, I think that the Department of Transportation has come to a sense of yes, we can control invasive species on their you know, sides along the road where they want to have nice, nice native plants. Two, you know, two years ago, anyway, they were born just mowing. There was no connection or no consideration. For the natives uh, or for the invasive species themselves. So, uh, you justify an agronomist that they should go in there and, and harvest them so that they could kill off the invasives. I mean, they harvest the invasives first, maybe, or something like that, at yeah. least when they're. Um, yeah. And that way you'd be able to control them better. Because otherwise, you harvest everything all at once, you basically take away any advantage that you would have. Yep. Yeah. So um, a lot of the restoration literature shows really convincingly that if you can um, basically knock back those invasives early in the season and late in the season, then you're in a much better position. So the ideal scenario would be to, in the spring, to get goats or um, yearling cattle out on the field and try and basically force them into the near like the wetter areas so that they, because they don't really like to eat wetland plants that much, but they'll eat them if they're like young shoots and they don't have another option. <laughs> so force them into that area and be like, you can eat green canary grass, guys. And they'll be like, okay, sure, whatever. Uh, because they're cows, right? You gotta give them corn eventually. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so that'll help to knock back those invasives early in the season. Um, and then in the summer months, so basically late June through mid-August, you'll let it go and just be the warm seasons. And then in the fall, ideally you would go out and you would harvest the biomass and then maybe try and turn that into like, like compost or something like that. Um, because, you know, I mean, it's a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. Why not put it in someone's garden. As long as you hot compost it, the invasives are going to be dead. But you have to leave that that warm season period open. And, and 
one added thing. The nice thing about goats and cattle is that it allows waterfowl to still nest. So if you go in with a combine, you're going to crush nests or you're going to tear up the parent bird, right? Like I can I not even tell you how many times I've seen that. And it's terrible. But goats and cows, they go around that. Like they see the bird, they're like, okay, I can't go there, right? Birds can be pretty scary when they're nesting. So it's a much better solution for everybody involved. And it helps the farmer who's, who's raising the cattle because they have access to land. It helps you with the management. The, the biggest hurdle is getting fencing up to hold the, the, the livestock in. to take into account is that denitrification requires nitrate and so if you're even if you're in ferment for denitrification right you're anoxic you know you've got all the carbon you could ever want if you don't have any nitrate around you're never going to do the denitrification so in these systems you need to have the coupling component and and frankly, the root, there's a lot more, a lot more of a, a dense and intense root system in the seasonal basin, in addition to the fact, so that allows for coupled nitrification, denitrification. In addition, the drawdown, those an, the annual drawdown definitely, I think, is promoting or stimulating the nitrification component. Um, are you planning on monitoring these like for the more long term to see? I would love to. Um, I mean, kind of need to. I need, I need to find a way to do that. If I like, if I could find the money, I would totally do that because I think that these are going to change a lot over time. Um, you can already see that there's year-to-year -year differences, and the development of these basins um, has just been really cool to see. Like, what? So animals sometimes will come in and totally change what the wetland looks like. Like. Muskrats, if they come in at a certain time frame, will actually completely change how these how these systems look. They come in in the first two years, they eat out all the, the cattails, and and you basically bought yourself another couple of years of cattail bleed. Um, so, I mean, I'd love to continue to monitor and sort of see what happens as as they get older. New wetland gets a free muskrat. Free muskrats for everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that idea. Any other questions? Let's thank Winnie again.